All right, so now I'm going to kind of try to work my way through some comments. And again, if I don't get to yours, I will either get to it or I'll have to, you know, I'm going to do the best I can to get through as many as I can in a reasonable amount of time. Okay, so this is referring to the Maria Khorova video that I broke down for you guys. And it goes something like this. I'm going to need glasses as soon as what's happening. Okay, let's so all read to it. If uh, Maria Khorova had a body that was slightly stockier, do you think these issues with placement would show more? Show more uh, to an ex to me, no, but to the outside ballet world, probably yes. Yes, I think that's right. Uh, continuing, I sometimes wonder if the preference for very thin bodies in the last 40 years, since Balanchine really, uh, which is right, has anything to do with this. Example, is it cheaper for companies to have thin dancers who don't require ongoing training to maintain the aesthetic, in quotes, of turnout without having to invest in coaches and ongoing training. So this last bit is really the key. This is a very, very insightful question. I'm gonna read it to you again. Is it cheaper for companies, cheaper, to have, the th have thin dancers like Horova or Misty, any, any of them, uh, who don't require ongoing training to maintain the aesthetic? The aesthetic, yes, yes, okay, okay. Let's, take, let's get into this one. So here's the thing about aesthetic. So I have to, I have to take you on a little bit of a journey here to, 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 to get to the answer. No matter what the person looks like, how am I gonna say this? Okay, let, let's, let's answer it like this. So yes, 30, 40 years ago, there was this trend of of starting to this base the standards of acceptance into the world's big ballet schools on a particular aesthetic, which ends up being uh, hypermobility. Hypermobility is a big part of it. And then, yes, very thin, hypermobile, et cetera. Now, let me say this. Just think for a minute, Barushnikov, Nureyev, Vasiliev, Maximova, Plisetskaya, Dudinskaya, take these great legends as kids. Would any of them be accepted into, the, into their own academies, Vaganov or Bolshoi, much less anything anywhere else today? The answer is no. They had very average bodies, they, you know, as kids and even as adults, like you, you, and like, except for their posture and stuff like that, you wouldn't really know that they were dancers. They didn't have these, you know, the, that aesthetic, but they were the greatest dancers that we've ever known to this day. Right? They still eclipse pretty much anything else in their quality of movement, you know, and everything else that's layered on that. So really consider that for a minute, that the standards have changed from basically kind of normal kid body to this extraordinary looking bodies, aesthetically. And yet the result is not anything like what it was in terms of quality. The quality is much lower today of dancing. The people look amazing. Like you, it's, you look at male dancers and they look like Greek gods, but they jump, you know, this high. They have no jump, they have no power in their bodies. They can't generate power, you know, and then the partnering is just a mess. And then, you know, everybody's hurt. Everybody's hurt at a very young age. I mean, just all of them. So. Why, what happened? And that's, I think, the, the essence of this question with the aesthetic. So the answer is yes, but it doesn't begin l later in the profession. It begins right in the academies, the acceptance of, you know, the, the standards of acceptance. And what has happened is this, and I'll just talk about Russia because it's a clear case. So Russia had the standard of, they, they used to focus just on the person's mind, essentially. Obviously, there had to be a minimum level of potential in the body, but the bar on that was, was fairly low compared to today. You know, they didn't have to have all this flexibility because they understood that that doesn't help. 
at all. It's, a, it's not an asset to be super flexible. It's, it's, a, it's a burden, really, on the teacher and the student. So they used to look at you know, musicality uh, and their ability to take corrections and put it in their body. And then they just did a basic examination to see that they didn't have scoliosis and all that. But some of them did, and they accepted them anyway. And you know, correct ballet training trains that stuff out, the scoliosis. And some of them, Svetlana is an example of that. Misha will be the next example of that. So, they're ex so what has happened is that they are, for the last, let's, let's call it 20, 30 years, they are accepting based on, they're trying to get, this is a really goofy thing. So number one, there are a lot of privately owned ballet schools in Russia. So kids are coming to these auditions at Vaganova, let's say, with already some kind of training. Some of them are even on point, you know, and they're, they're eight, nine years old. And so Maria Khorova, for example, comes from rhythmic gymnastics, which is not ballet. It, it's just not ballet. It's the opposite of ballet. You know, for people who don't really know what they're looking at, it looks similar. It's not similar. Because rhythmic gymnastics is parallel. It's parallel. And they don't work on point. And it's not about ballet technique. They don't have the porter bar. They don't have the back. They don't have any of that. They don't need any of that for what they do. They're dealing with their little instrument, the ball or the hula hoop or whatever it is they use. So it's just a completely different thing. So the idea that we're going to merge these is a terrible, it's terrible. So they're selecting, they're trying to select bodies that when they're young, so a 10 or 11 year old or 12 year old, that look like the finished ballerinas used to look in terms of their, you understand? So aesthetic has taken precedent over technique which requires a, a certain kind of mind to process that out, right? I'm talking about the student now. So we, we, we've, it, it's, it's all about the way the body looks and not about the way the mind functions and the body functions, the potential in the body. Now here's the catch, and this is, this is getting a little bit into the weeds. Whatever the body looks like at 10 or 11 years old has little to do with what's going to look like later. And this is from a professional standpoint. If you're a professional, if you're dealing with professional pedagogue, professional coach, professional teacher, you understand one thing. What the person starts as is not how it's going to end, given it's per the person's professionally trained, right? So it doesn't really matter how a kid looks when they start. Obviously, they have to have some potential. This is a given. But they're going to be kid-like, awkward and bony, and they're not going to grow. I mean, obviously, all of us that have been through adolescence, we don't grow symmetrically. You know, right leg will be longer for a while, one arm will be longer, a foot will be bigger. You know, this is, so when they start, you know, 9, 10, 11 years old, it's pretty consistent and they look very, you know, you see like the old Soviet documentaries, they look very beautiful, all little kids. From about 12, 13, 14, things get really clunky and awkward for those few years where they're growing and everything's happening in adolescence. And then, you know, 16, 17, 18, things stabilize again, and then they graduate and go on to the theater where the coaching needs to continue. All founded on the fundamentals, as I explained in a previous podcast, right? So they're, select, they're trying to select based on aesthetic when here's what happens. You can select by whatever, on whatever basis you want, but they, what they're not understanding and they need to understand is, if you're training placement, fundamentals, which is turnout, into a body, that body is going to change shape anyway. Okay, so you can start with a perfectly flexible straight back, and if you're training correctly, things are going to move around in a very non-symmetrical way. Right, because the, the, the hips, the butt, is going to develop strength quicker than the core. And the core and the butt combination is going to develop strength quicker than the back. The back's a very specialized training, right? And the thighs are going to sometimes overpower the core and the butt. So you straighten your legs, the butt pops out, you put it back, the legs loosen, the core goes in. It, so this is the puzzle, right? And there's a very specific way to get this done, and that's what, of course, we'll be sharing with you. So even if you begin with this, whatever this stand, this unrealistic standard is this perfect aesthetic little child, or even 12-year-old, 
the moment you start putting real ballet training into their body, it's all going to change and get awkward anyway. So there's no point to look at it. There's no point to, to worry about the, the, the beginning. What you want is a kid ultimately with no training at all, no stretching at all, nothing. Raw person. And you begin with the fundamentals and the detail, but stretching, flexibility has to be according to the fundamentals. You only stretch to the extent that it serves the fundamentals. You don't need all of this flexibility, right? You can do it if you want, provided it's based on the fundamentals. You understand? So with the fundamentals as our guide, that's how you stay on track. That's how you know. That's how you always will make decisions from this point forward. You go, okay, is whatever I'm seeing or doing consistent with the fundamentals? Yes, you're on the right track. It doesn't matter how your body feels or how awkward things are or how confusing things get. As long as you're on the fundamentals, you will get to the next step. And this is the reality of it. I hope that answered your question. So yes, they're trying to skip the, I mean, what has happened is they've skipped the fundamentals thinking that the aesthetic was going to do something and it's just, it's been a, an, an unmitigated failure, right? That's it. It's a question of how long it's going to take for the ballet world to sort of recognize that misstep. Um, and then integrate placement into their curriculums and get things going in the right direction. Okay, that's that question. I'll...